Hello and welcome to Neurosurgery Written Board Crash Course. Today we'll be talking about the overall anatomy and function of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is often known as the little brain. And just like the cerebrum counterpart, it also has gray and white matters, with gray matters on the surface of the cere cerebellum and white matter deep to it. The cerebellum is tightly folded, just like the cerebrum, and forming the cerebellar cortex on the outside. The white matter is located underneath the cerebellar cortex. And similarly, as in the case of cerebrum with their deep nuclei called basal ganglia, embedded in the white matters of the cere cerebellum are the four deep cerebellar nuclei. And in order to study the cerebellum, we have to classify it and divide it into sections, just like its cerebrum counterparts. And in general, the cerebellum consists of two hemispheres, which are connected by the vermis, a narrow midline area. And there are roughly three ways that the cerebellum can be subdivided, namely the anatomical lobes, zones, and functional divisions. The most, the most obvious one is the lobes classification. On a mid-sagittal view, as in this picture here, there are three anatomical lobes that can be distinguished in the cerebellum, the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe and the nodular lobe. These lobes are divided by two fissures, the primary fissure and a posterior lateral fissure. You can also subdivide the lobes into lobules, and there are nine lobules of the vermis listed here. It's not too important to memorize every single one of them for the exam, so I'll just leave it at that. The cerebellum is a C-shaped structure with lobes separated horizontally. If you turn this cerebellum 90 degrees and look at it from a dorsal view, and you unroll the C-shaped structure and flatten the cerebellum, you get to place the vermis in one plane. And this view provides a very good look at the lobe and the zone classification. There are three cerebellar zones. In the midline of the cerebellum is the vermis. On either side of the vermis is the intermediate zones. And lateral to the intermediate zone are the lateral hemispheres. There is no difference in the gross structure between the lateral hemisphere and the intermediate zones. Before we move on to the functional classifications of the cerebellum, we have to make a note of the intrinsic nuclei of the cerebellum. The cerebellar nuclei sits deep in the cerebellar white matter, and there are four pairs. And if you recall from med school, the mnemonic is don't eat greasy food with dentate, emboliform, globus, and vestigial, and dentate being the most lateral and vestigial being the most medial, as depicted in this picture here. The dentate nucleus is the largest of the cerebellar nuclei, and it's situated in the lateral hemispheres, in the deep in the white matter of the lateral hemispheres. It resembles a crushed paper bag with its open end facing anterior medially. And it is named dentate because of its tooth-like serrated edge. It takes on this shape because unlike the other nuclei, the dentate nucleus partially encloses bundles of white matter that form the dentato-rubothalamic and the dentato-olivary tracts, and we'll cover those tracts in future videos. The 
emboliform and globus nuclei listed here are usually grouped together because they pretty much serve the same function and they're together called the interpositus nucleus and they sit deep to the intermediate zone of the cerebellum the fastigial nucleus are the most medial structures and are under the midline roof of the fourth ventricle deep to the vermis. The cerebellum can also be divided by function. There are three functional areas of the cerebellum, namely the cerebral cerebellum, the spinal cerebellum, and the vestibular cerebellum. And each one of these functional areas can be mapped onto one zone of the cerebellum and one pair of the deep nucleus. As a rule of thumb, the cerebral cerebellum, comprised of mostly the lateral hemispheres, is the largest division, and it is intricately connected with the cerebral cortex. It also maps to the dentate nucleus that lies deep to the lateral hemisphere. And because of the connections with the cerebrum, the, this part of the cerebellum is involved in coordination, planning movements, and motor learning. So basically coordination in short. The spinal cerebellum is comprised of the vermis and the adjacent intermediate zones of the cerebellar hemispheres. It maps also to the interpositus nucleus deep to the intermediate zones of the cerebellum. There are extensive connections between the cerebellum and the spinal cord and the brainstem. And so they're mostly involved in control of muscle tones and regulates the balance and posture. The vestibular cerebellum is basically the functional equivalent to the flocculonodular lobe, as well as the vestigial nucleus. It is involved in the controlling of balance and ocular reflexes, and they receive inputs from the vestibular system, as the name suggests, and sends outputs back to the vestibular, vestibular nuclei. Similar to the cerebral counterparts, the cerebellum can also be classified based on its evolutionary age. And similar to the naming system in the cerebrum, the cerebellum is also classified into archicerebellum, paleocerebellum, and neocerebellum. The oldest of them all is called the archicerebellum. And archi is Greek for beginning. And this part of the cerebellum is practically essentially equivalent to the flocular nodular lobe, which is equivalent to the vestibular cerebellum. Next up in line is the paleo cerebellum, or equivalent to the spinal cerebellum. Now in the last slide, we said that the spinal cerebellum is consist of the vermis and the contiguous paramedian cortex. If you look at it from another way, you can see that the anterior lobe is practically the bulk, a big part of the vermis and the intermediate zone. And so that's why some people refers to the anterior lobe as the spinal cerebellum. Now finally, we have the neocerebellum, which is the newest addition and the most developed in the human uh, cerebellum than other animals. And this is equivalent to the cerebral cerebellum. And the major portion of the human cerebellar hemisphere, 
which is this big portion of the posterior lobe, falls into this, the largest subdivision, which is the cerebellar hemisphere. And so people also refer to the neocerebellum as the posterior lobe, which is also equivalent to the cerebral cerebellum. So to tie everything together, the vestibulocerebellum, or also known as the floccular nodular lobe of the cerebellum, receives a substantial amount of its input from the vestibular nerve. And so it is important in the balance and vestibular system. And this lobe is unique because uh, no other portion of the cerebellum receives direct input from a sensory nerve. And additionally, there are connections from the vestibular nuclei to the vestibular cerebellum. The spinal cerebellum, as we said before, this portion of the cerebellum includes the vermis and paravermal zones uh, of the anterior and part of the posterior lobe. It receives extensive input from the spinal cord. And so the spinal cerebellum is important in regulating muscle tone and in adapting the body to changing circumstances. And since spinal cerebellum includes both vermal and paravermal zones, where the vestigial and interposed nuclei are located deep to them, the vestigial nuclei and interposed nucleus are both involved in these pathways. The vestigial nucleus controls more of the proximal and axial trunk muscles while the interposed uh, nuclei connects to the lateral extremity muscles. And therefore the spinal cerebellum can influence both muscle tone and coordination of the extremities. The cerebellum, the cerebral cerebellum, sorry, connects between the cerebral cortex with the cerebellum. And the cerebral cortex sends fibers first to the pontine nuclei, and the pontine nuclei then relay the message to the cerebellum. This is the largest input of the cerebellum and almost exclusive input to the neocerebellum. And the neocerebellum then connects to the dentate nuclei, which lies deep to the lateral hemisphere. And the dentate nucleus then projects to the ventrolateral and ventral anterior nucleus of the thalamus, which then relays back to the cerebral cortex. And so the lateral hemisphere of the cere cerebellum are involved in regulating the cerebral cortical motor outputs. The best known effects of this is in procedural learning. Activities uh, such as riding a bike or uh, learning to ski involve activities of the cerebellar hemispheres. And damage to the lateral hemispheres results in a lack of coordination of limb movement with um, overshoot and undershoot, also often known as uh, intentional tremors. Here's a uh, quick and dirty summary slide of the major functions of each lobes and tracts and their associations. And we will go over each one of these in more detail in the next few videos. But this slide is very important uh, for the board exam. And if you remember nothing from these set of videos, this is the slide to memorize for the exam because it's very high yield. These are my references. I uh, hope you find these helpful and I'll see you next time.